All right, we are in Romans chapter 8. We have been uh, working through, we've been talking about adoption. And now we're getting into the next section where, he, where Paul talks about creation groaning. And it's an interesting, it's, a, it's an interesting picture. Uh, in verses 18 to 22, so I'm just going to go ahead and read those right now, talk a little bit about those. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willing, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty, the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now, as we read this idea, especially in verse 22, where it says, we know the whole world, uh, that we know the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Uh, it's interesting, this, this description is a description that's associated with a woman in childbirth. Okay, and why is that important? Because for any woman that has gone through childbirth, you know there is an immense pain involved. Okay, and so you know what it is to go through childbirth, but that pain is immediately replaced with a joy that cannot be really described other than just felt when you have a healthy baby and you're holding the baby, and now all of a sudden, that pain and everything that you went through was, is in the past. It's already gone. Okay, yes, there may be some lingering side effect, you know, for a little while, but the fact is, your focus is not on the pain that you just went through. Your focus now is on that beautiful little baby and the love that is there. Okay, and so it's, an, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful picture because right now we are going through trials and we're going through groaning and the, and the creation is going through groaning. When you look at this, verse 18 talks about suffering, verse 20, vanity, verse 21, bondage and decay, verse 22, pain. So there's a, there's a, real, there's a real groaning here going on. And we, we know this is from the original sin. This is from Adam's sin. And the, it wasn't just that Adam was cursed, Eve was cursed, that mankind was cursed, the ground was cursed, the earth was cursed. Sin has that impact. You know, one of the things this reminds me of is this. You, you may ask this question, and of course, it's, a, it's somewhat of, of a facetious question, but it still gets to the point. What did creation do to deserve to be cursed? You know, well, it didn't do anything, okay? That was just one of the effects of sin. That's one of the impacts of sin, one of the consequences of sin. When you look around at the world today, oftentimes those who are, who are hurt the most by sin are the innocent ones. Okay, it's a, it's a hard thing. You have one person who sins, yet it may be another person who suffers the, the greatest impact of that sin. Okay, and I'm not going to start going into all the details of different things or anything like that. But the fact is, you say, well, is, is that fair? Is that right? And, you know, the bottom line, the bottom line of all of that is we have to recognize the effect of sin. Sin cannot be contained. You can't, you can't, you know, we, we, we've got to get away from this idea that there are little sins and big sins and that somehow I can, I can sin a little bit and it's okay. Or I can do this sin isn't a big sin. If I commit this sin, it's no problem. I won't do this one because this is a big sin, but this one's okay. We've got to get away from that idea. Because if you think about what was the original sin, you know, what was it? Was it murder? You know, was it theft? Was it stealing? Literally, it was disobedient to parents. I mean, you, you can call different things. I mean, obviously, they did, they did what they were not supposed to do, but God the Father told them, don't do this, and they did that. And, you know, we, we would normally think, oh, disobedient to parent, that's not nearly as important as, you know, that's not nearly as big a sin as murder or whatever. You can't control the consequences of sin. Can't control the, quote, unquote, side effects of sin. And so one of the effects of sin was that creation was also cursed. And of course, we see that. I mean, we've heard it. I mean, many of our prayers this morning were uh, for physical issues, and the praises were for the healing of physical issues. 
uh, you know, why do we have a bad back and a bad leg? And I'm, I'm just talking about myself now. Um, why do we have those things? Okay, you know, I, I would like to say it's because I was working and if I gave up work, it'd be okay, but that, that's probably not the answer. Uh, you know, the answer is why do we have them? Because we age, because we do deteriorate physically. Okay, and that's all part of the curse. And so we, we recognize that. And so what is Paul emphasizing here? Is he emphasizing the effect of sin and, and the, the curse? No, he's emphasizing the temporary nature of this. You know, as he describes verse 22 with the idea of childbirth, pain in childbirth, pain in childbirth is temporary. And once it's gone, boy, the joy is there, and it's like the pain never happened. And he's saying, the things that we go through in this life, in this world, are temporary. And when we pass from this world and we join the Lord, there's going to be such joy that the pain's not going to matter at all. It's going to have no impact on us at all. It'll be forgotten. That's the idea. Why is that the idea? Because what, what is one of the biggest things that stops Christians from serving Christ? You could list several of them. One of them is the fear of what may happen, the concern of what we'd go through, possible you know, physical issues as well as spiritual issues. You say, I'm just, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to go. It's funny when you talk to, when you talk to people about uh, being willing to just yield to the Lord and do whatever it is that he would have them do, one of the first responses to that often is, well, if I do that, he's going to make me a missionary in Africa. You know, we talked about that. And so the fear of going and doing something in a place maybe I don't want to be or doing something that I'm not comfortable doing, God normally does not call us to do that which we are best at. Now, that may sound like an oxymoron, or that may sound like a contradiction. Excuse me, that may sound like a contradiction. But that's exactly the way God works because he doesn't want us depending on us. He wants us depending on him. And so he often calls us to do those things that we don't feel capable or equipped to do. And then he provides everything we need to do it. And then he thanks us afterwards for having done what he, which is just a, a reasonable response anyway. But in all of that, what Paul is saying here is, listen, this is a temporary thing. The, the, the groaning, the suffering, what you're going through is temporary. Don't focus on the temporary. You focus on the permanent. You focus on the eternal. Uh, in, first, in 2 Corinthians 4, 15 through 18, Paul wrote this. For all things are for your sake that the abundant grace might through thanksgiving of many rebound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That is a great introduction for this next passage because one of the things Paul goes on to talk about then is the hope that we have in Christ, and it's not seen. Paul's emphasis in this section is that what we are going through now is temporary, so view it as temporary. Don't let it stop you, but keep in focus the, etern the eternality of God and the eternal purpose that God has for us while we're here. God has for us, as long as we are living and breathing on planet earth, God has a purpose for us and a will for us. Isn't it better for us to be with God? If we know Christ as Savior, wouldn't it be better for us to be with him? Paul said that. Paul said, man, for me, to, for me to, live, for, to die is Christ. Okay, for me personally, boy, it'd be much better just to, just to be home with the Lord right now. He said, no, I'm here for a reason. Of course, he said, he said it was for, you know, for the people there. Do you realize we're here for a reason? We are here because God has something for us. 
And as we, as we read in 2 Corinthians, Paul may even, you know, Paul says, hey, the, though the outward man perish, the outward man is, is breaking down. You know, all of us in here can relate to that. None of us feel the same way we did when we were 20. Okay, I get that. I've been there, done that, doing that. <laughs> the fact is, we are not what we were. The, old, the outer man, the outward man is perishing. But what does he say? Inward man renewed day by day. If we focus on the struggles and the difficulties, we lose the joy of the service and we lose the purpose for why God has us here. If all we're trying to do is just make it through each day, okay, my back is aching today, so I'm going to lay down a little bit more. My knee is hurting today, so I'm not going to get up and walk. I'm just going to lay here, and maybe tomorrow, that's, Paul says, no, that's the wrong thinking. And by the way, Paul is not denying the reality of the breaking down of the physical, okay? The outward man perishing. He's not denying that at all. In fact, in verse 22, when he uses this description, travaileth in pain, I, you know, I've heard it said there are very few things in life that are more painful than childbirth. And I have no reason to doubt that or deny that. And I believe, I'm not, I'm, believe me, I'm not gonna start trying. Okay, you know, for a number of ladies have given testimony. It was the hardest thing they've ever gone through and the greatest joy they've ever had. And that's why Paul uses this as the, as the description. That's why Paul uses this as why, how he is showing the relationship between the physical, the temporary, and the eternal, the spiritual. Let us not get so caught up in the physical issues that we forget the spiritual. But we are to be focused on the spiritual in spite of the physical, recognizing the physical is simply temporary, but the spiritual is eternal. And so Paul tells us, don't focus on today's sufferings, but look, for, look forward to tomorrow's glory. Verse 18 just sums that up so well. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. How is it that Jim Elliott and others were so willing and so able to give their lives in trying to reach the Aukas, even to the point of not defending themselves when they could have, not taking the life of one of the Aukas? How were they able to do that? Why? Because they reckoned that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. You know, as Jim Elliott said, and I'll probably get this slightly wrong, but as Jim Elliott said, he is no fool to give up that which he cannot keep to, get, to grab hold of that which he cannot lose. He understood what Paul was saying here. I'm not going to try to hold on to my life. I'm not going to try to hold on to my things. I'm not going to try to hold on. You know, sure, I want to do all I can to have good health so that I can do more for the Lord. I'm going to do all I can to accomplish and achieve those things, but I'm not going to let the physical issues stop me from spiritual growth, spiritual renewal, and spiritual service. And so he goes on and he says that. The, but it's not just the world that's groaning, verses 23 to 25, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan are within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, hope that is not, um, we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And here the focus is this. Paul is not asking whether or not the believer has hope. He says the believer has, should have that hope. The believer's got the Holy Spirit dwelling on them. The believer's got the, the righteousness of Christ placed on them. The believer has been adopted into the family of God. Paul's gone through all these things that show us our current status based on who we are because we ask Christ, we, we, we ask Christ to forgive our sins and to be our Savior. That's a one-time thing. All these irreversible things happen at the moment of salvation. And I say irreversible because you cannot lose your salvation. 
All these things happen instantaneously. And then there is, of course, also the process of sanctification. But what does Paul say? Paul says at this point, it's easy for us to focus on that which we see. But the hope we have is not based on that which we see. It's not based on the physical. It's based on the spiritual. It's based on the reality of God. That's why we need to know God. God has not called us to a blind faith. God has not called us to close our eyes and just hope that he's a good God. He has given us his word to reveal himself to us so that we might know him and know him and know him the better and better we can. And the more we know him, the stronger our hope is, the stronger our faith is because of who he is. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And the, our hope comes with that. But Paul says, what is your hope? What's your hope in? Is your hope in the things that you can see? No. Better not be, shouldn't be, can't be. Okay, your hope needs to be in that which is not seen, in that which is of the Lord. So Paul says, look, I know we're groaning. The, the creation's groaning. We're groaning. We're all dealing with this. Paul says, don't focus on that. Focus on the hope that we have in Christ. And remember, the biblical definition of hope means we know without any doubt that it's going to happen. You say, well, why do we call it hope? And why don't we just call it knowledge or faith? It's hope because we don't know when it's going to happen. I have the hope of eternal life. Okay, now that does not mean I'm sitting here going, oh, I really hope I have eternal life. I'll flip a coin and see if it's true. No. I have the hope of eternal life. I know I have eternal life. I just don't know when it's going to kick in. Okay. <laughs> I don't know when I'm going to start experiencing eternal life with, with Christ. I know my home's in glory. I have that hope. Okay, I just don't know when it's going to happen. And do I have a lot of questions about it? Sure. Okay, but I have no questions about the fact that it's going to happen. What's it like to be with God forever? I don't know, but I'm looking forward to it. Okay, from everything that God's described. And so what do I want to do? Well, you know what? That's coming. I have that hope. That's coming. Nothing can take that away now. Okay, and what's so interesting is Paul puts this squarely as God's responsibility. When I have asked Christ to be Savior, there is now nothing I can do to change that, to replace that, because I just placed myself in God's hands. And God says, I got you. Christ said, no man can take, can take anyone from his hand. That includes ourselves. And so it's so important to remember my faith, my security, my assurance of salvation, my service for him, all of that is not based on me and what I'm doing. And, you know, most people, when they struggle, when they stop serving, when they start to doubt whether they're saved, all of that, they do that because they lose focus of where we are. We are squarely in God's control, and we are in Christ's hand. Nothing can happen. It is set. It is sealed for eternity. We've been given the Holy Spirit, the earnest of our salvation. God doesn't take the earnest away. Okay, we're not, we can't lose it. And so Paul is emphasizing this hope. And then verses 25 through 30, and we'll go 25 through 27 first, uh, talks about the Holy Spirit's part of this. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We don't talk a lot about the Holy Spirit. But do you realize right now in each of our lives, the Holy Spirit has the ministry of praying for us? Who better than God the Holy Spirit to pray for us. You know, one of the things that can be frustrating for someone who's praying is when you get to the point where you say, I don't know what to pray for. I don't know how to pray about this. You know, you come, you're, you're praying, and maybe there's a big decision in your life. And you, know, you either way, there, there's nothing wrong with either way, but you know you got to go one way or the other. You're like, I don't know which way to pray. 
Well, at times like that, do you know who does know which way to pray? Holy Spirit dwelling in us, dwelling within us. Holy Spirit's praying for us. The Holy Spirit, we often don't think of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is personally praying for each one of us, is indwelling us, is leading us, is guiding us, is know, knows the way of truth, and is leading us that direction. We have all we need to navigate this world. Don't we? And Paul says, you've got everything you need. You've got your relationship with God. He's your father. You've got purpose in life. And of course, especially Romans 12, 1 and 2 and, and other passages like that we're coming to. You've got the Holy Spirit guiding you. So in all of this, what's his word to us? Don't let the physical issues distract you. Don't focus on those. They're temporary. Focus on the permanent. And by the way, when you get to a point you don't know what to do, it's okay. The Holy Spirit's there praying for you as well. And he then, he, he brings all this together and he sums this up. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. This is a verse that is often quoted, but it's a reminder to us when we see something happening that we immediately say, this is bad, this is, this is a bad thing, it's easy for us to ask the question, why? You know, why is this happening? And Paul says we have the assurance that even when bad things happen, God can use it for good. And of course, there are testimonies throughout history of bad things happening that were used in a great way by God for good. The fact is, how does this tie in? What has Paul just gotten done saying in much of this chapter? Don't focus on the physical, on the temporary. Don't let that affect you. Don't let that stop you. Focus on the eternal. What's Paul saying in verse 28? Don't focus on the physical. Don't focus on the temporal. Don't let that stop you. Why? All things can work together for good to them love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Don't take your eyes off of Christ, off of his purpose. You know, and of course, we see the practical application of this with Peter when he was walking on the water, which you got to think about that. That's a pretty incredible thing walking on the water, okay? And yet, what happened? As soon as he took his eyes off and he, and he focused on the problems instead of on Christ, he lost that power, he lost that ability, and he started sinking. Something to, rem something to remember about all that, though. Paul says, you know, Paul reminds us, take the eyes off the physical. Don't focus on that. And sometimes we just realize wow, all I've been doing is getting wrapped up in the physical. All I've been doing is getting wrapped up in this. Lord, I'm sinking. Help who is always there with a handout ready to pull us up and keep us going. Just like Peter, when he was walking on the water, Christ is always there. We have that assurance. And so we want to focus on that. Verse 28, we want, to, we want to remember that no matter how we see it, God recognizes, God uses all things, can use all things for good. He is that great of a God. Now, verse 29, verses 29 and 30, are some pretty controversial verses. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first fruit, the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. There are some who will turn to this and, and talk about the, the, uh, I, the idea of predestination, that God has chosen those who will go to heaven and those who won't. I think when you study scripture, is predestination part of scripture? Absolutely. Is free will part of scripture? Absolutely. How do they work together? Absolutely. That's all I can give you. <laughs> okay. Do they work together? Yes. How? That is way beyond my ability to comprehend. Okay. So, you know, I don't want to get into the, well, is it, is it either or? 
you know, we tend, if you, if you look at the number of arguments that are out there today, people arguing for this or for that or whatever, so many times they try to break it down to an either or argument. It's either this or this. Well, in scripture, I see it's both. Now, in my mind, I can't bring that together. But that's okay, because in my mind, I can't bring together the Trinity in all ways. I know it's true. I have no doubt about the truth of it. But how do you have one God, three persons, three different personalities? One, I, how does that all work? I don't have all the details. And if you look at the way man has tried to understand it, whether it's through the three-leaf clover or it's through the egg or it's through the three stages of water, none of it works. Why? Because it's God. And there are things that are, his ways are greater than our ways. And there are things I will not understand about him till I'm in heaven and I have a perfect mind instead of the one I've got. And so, yes, there are things that I know are true because the Bible says it's true, but I don't know how they're true. And that's okay to say that. I hope it's okay to say it because I'm just saying it. Okay, that's okay to say that. It's okay to say, I don't know. I know it's true. I just don't know how. I think verses 29 and 30, I don't believe they have anything to do with predestination. I think they have to do with eternal security. And so let me explain why. For those he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Now, there's no question at this point, God is predestinating. In other words, he is deciding ahead of time what he's going to do in a certain situation. He has predestined that. Now, the question is, what is he predestinating? People assume that when the Bible talks about election or it talks about predestination, it's always referring to salvation. But I have found that in most cases, it doesn't even refer to salvation. It often refers to service. And in fact, that's what I wrote my, doc my, my, my doctoral dissertation on. The fact that election is not limited to salvation. So when we see predestination or we see the word elect or something like that, we have to be careful that we don't assume it has a meaning, but we've got to look at the context. We've got to look at what it's saying. So it says, God foreknew and those for whom he did foreknow. So in other words, he knew something about people and something that he knew about people for what he knew, he then predestinated them. What did he predestinate them to be? Conformed to the image of his son. So God knew something about people, a group of people, obviously not everyone. And that group of people that he knew something about, he predestinated them to be conformed to the image of his son. And then those that are conformed to the image of his son, he called, he justified, and he glorified. So what's this saying? I believe what he foreknew was whether we would choose to receive Christ as Savior. I believe that's the foreknowledge. And then those that he knew would receive Christ as Savior, he predestinated them to be conformed to the image of the Son. What does that mean? That means that before the, the beginning of time itself, before the earth was created, before the foundations were laid, when, God, when it was God and God alone, he already knew who would receive him as Savior. And he said, those that choose to receive me, I will predestinate them to be conformed to the image of the Son. What does that mean? That means everyone who receives Christ will be conformed to the image of God's Son, and there's nothing you can do to stop it once you have received Christ. By the way, this ties in so perfectly with so many verses, Philippians 1.6, he that has performed a good work in you will continue it until the day of Christ Jesus. Well, how is he able to continue it if at some point I lose my salvation? No, you can't. The fact is, I believe, and you know, you believe differently, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not going to argue this because it is a difficult passage. But I believe the foreknowledge is the foreknowledge of who would, who would ask Christ to be Savior. He did predestinate them to be conformed to the image of his son. And by the way, there's something new in the New Testament. There's something new in the church age that is different from the Old Testament. We don't enter into... You know, in the Old Testament, God was using the Jewish nation. You entered into the Jewish nation through physical birth, through being born into a Jewish family. And there were some other ways, but that was the primary way. In the New Testament, you in, we have the church age. You enter into the church through spiritual birth. In the Old Testament, there were certain individuals that were called to serve God. 
I believe in the New Testament, every believer is called to serve God. And I believe this is, and one of the reasons I believe this is this, these two verses right here. So if, of course, and I understand the foreknowledge, if you believe it's, he's foreknowing something else, that's fine. If he foreknew who would be received as Christ, who would accept Christ as Savior, he predestinated him to be conformed to the image of the Son. So what he's saying is all those who receive Christ are going to be conformed to the image of God's Son. They cannot lose that salvation. It will happen. It's guaranteed by God. Then, but it's not just that. Moreover, verse 30, whom he did predestinate, them he called. What did he call them to? Well, clearly he didn't call them to salvation because they're already saved. Because nobody who is not saved is going to be conformed to the image of God's Son. So at this point, he is definitely talking about those who know Christ as Savior. So what is he doing then? He's saying those that know Christ as Savior, those who are conformed to the image of his Son, they are called. I believe every person here, I believe every believer on earth is called to serve God. Now, it doesn't mean vocationally. Okay, so let me make sure that's clear. I'm not saying every person has to be a pastor or a missionary or Christian school teacher or whatever. I'm not talking about vocation. I'm talking about life. In whatever vocation God has called you, are, are you serving him? In the vocation God has called me, am I serving him? Because God has called every one of us to serve him in some way. I believe that is one of the things this passage is saying. It's not just salvation anymore. It's salvation and it's service. Ephesians 2. Okay, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 are well known. You know, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We, we talk about that all the time. It's, it talks about salvation. Salvation is by grace through faith. But we stop there. What about Ephesians 2.10? We are his workmanship in Christ Jesus, created unto good works. Why? That they may glorify the Father. You see, in the church, I believe in the church age, and we are in the church age, we are all called to serve. Now, those forms of service will be completely different. 1 Corinthians 12, picture of the body. Okay, we're all different parts of the body. We're not all doing the same thing, but we are, I believe we are all called to serve. So if we're not serving, that's shame on us because we are called to serve. We have been equipped to serve. We have been designed to serve. We have been created under good works to serve. Oh, and then he says, and those he called, he justified. And whom he justified, he glorified. And you say, well, that seems like kind of a funny order. You know, one of the things that I've often said when you're studying scripture and things don't seem to be done in the way, things are done in a way that seems different or seems unnecessary or it seems out of order. Think about that. Stop on that for a minute because God's telling us something. One of the classic examples I use is, is Genesis chapter three. Adam and Eve have sinned. God's walking in the garden because he's been walking with them. And he says, Adam, where are you? And my first question is this. Did God really not know where Adam was? Okay, obviously that wasn't an issue. So the question is this. Why did God ask? We ought to be thinking about that. Because God chose to do something that he didn't have to do and he didn't need to do. And obviously he didn't have to ask the question, where are you? but he did it intentionally for a reason. When I look here, notice it says he calls them and then them he calls, he justifies. You say, well, seems to me it would be the other way around. First you justify and then those that are justified, you call them and it's all set. I think one of the focuses here is this. How many times do people not serve God because they look at themselves and they say, I can't do it. They say, you don't know what, I, you don't know what I, I've done in my life. You don't know the way I've lived. You don't know the things I've thought or things I've done or, or whatever. And God says, that doesn't matter. Yeah, if you need to take care of them, take care of them. But that's not going to stop you from serving me. I've called you and I've justified you. So now nothing that has happened in your life has any bearing or weight on stopping you from serving me. 
I think the order is intentional because God calls us. And then what do we do? We question. Moses is a classic example of this. Moses, God called Moses to go talk to Pharaoh. Moses told the Lord as if the Lord needed telling. Oh, I'm slow of speech. I'm not very good at this. God said, it's okay. God said, I got you covered. Your weaknesses, I have all covered. And it wasn't until Moses questioned God's judgment and said, send somebody else, which was basically saying, God, you made a mistake in choosing me. That's when God said, okay, enough's enough. There are things in our lives, we look back on our lives and we know none of us look back on our lives and we're just happy with everything that's happened. We know there are things we've done we shouldn't have done. There are things we didn't do that we should have done. And God, I believe in saying he calls and he justifies. He says, I've called you to do this. You're justified. You don't need to worry about that. Set it aside. Serve me. And then what does he say? Then he justified. He also glorified. I, have, I, be, I believe verses 29 and 30 are telling us that we are secure. Those who receive Christ their Savior are secure in God. Our salvation is secure in him, and our standing is secure with him, and we are ready to go forward. You know, Paul has said, don't look at the physical. Don't worry about that. Hey, you're going to go through it. There's going to be pain. There's going to be great pain. I understand it, but don't focus on that. Focus on what God has for you. And by the way, this is why this is his purpose for you. This is his will for you. You see, it's so important for us to recognize that God is seeking to use each one of us. Now, it'll be different in every case, but he's seeking that each one of us would serve him. So the question for us this morning is this, are we serving him? And are we serving him in the way he wants us to serve him? Are we serving him according to his will or our will? You see, we may come to the point where we say, I recognize this, Lord. Okay, you want me to serve, so I'm going to go do something for you. That's not what God said. God says, I've got a will for you. I want you to do this. See, one of the problems is this. If I go choose what I want to do, I've immediately created two problems. One, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. So that's not getting done. And the second thing, I'm taking the spot that somebody else is supposed to have. You know, sometimes you, you hear about the old 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the work in the church is done by 20% of the people. And, we, and it's very easy to say, oh, well, that 80% of the people, that's just so wrong for them not to be serving. Well, I believe a lot of the reason that 20% of the people are doing 80% of the work and the 80% other 80 aren't doing a lot I believe part of the reason for that is the 20% are taking the role, taking the places of the 80% that are supposed to be serving. The 20% are wearing themselves out, doing too much, and because of what they're doing, they're not allowing others to get more involved. That's not always the case, but I think it's part of it. So it's so important for us that we not just recognize the need to serve God, but we need to serve him in the way, in the service that he has for us, not the one that we've chosen for us. Let's pray.